Hi, I'm Jonah Kember, and today I'm going to be talking about the dynamic configuration of EEG functional networks that occurs during response inhibition and how these differ between ADHD subtypes in a non-clinical population. I'm presenting this research alongside my co-authors, Carolyn Hare from Western University, as well as Dr. Ida Takakilik, Dr. Sydney Sigalowitz, and Dr. Aaron Panda, all from Brock University, located in Ontario, Canada. Now, the DSM-5 recognizes three subtypes of ADHD. There's the uh, inattentive subtype, the hyperactive impulsive, and the combined subtypes. And the traits associated with each are thought to exist on a continuum in the general population. Now, response inhibition, which is the ability to inhibit motor responses, is one of the primary deficits found in those with ADHD. In fact, measures of inhibition are often used as part of an ADHD diagnosis. Now, each subtype shows distinct deficits in this ability. Uh, recently, there's been a shift in how we understand the neural correlates of response inhibition. While previous research tended to favor a modular perspective, which thought that the right inferior frontal gyrus is crucial for inhibition and in that it receives these sensory signals and communicates with motor areas, uh, research now tends to favor a network perspective, which suggests that communication within the frontal parietal network dynamically shifts towards an efficient organization and that that efficiency is what promotes uh, response inhibition. Now, with this new um, theory, it's currently unknown whether there are specific deficits that are associated with each ADHD subtype. So to explore this idea, the current study correlates different measures of ADHD subtypes uh, with measures of the communication of that frontal parietal network. Specifically, we looked at the N2 ERP, which is a measure thought to reflect the local activation of these areas. And we also looked at phase synchronization, which measures the communication between different areas, and the global efficiency, which is a measure of how this communication organizes during processing. Now, this study uh, looked at 62 university students, again, from a non-clinical population that were aged 18 to 24. Uh, standard pre-processing steps were applied to the 128 channel EEG, which you can read about here in the methods. And we looked at PLI phase lag index as a measure of communication between areas. Now PLI uh, measures the consistency of phase differences between two signals across trials. And notably, it attenuates any activity with a phase difference of zero pi or two pi. And the idea of this is that it attenuates any activity that might only have occurred as a result of volume conduction from a single source. Now, the psychometric tests given to these uh, participants were self-report measures of ADHD traits measured by both the CARS rating scale and the DSM-4 rating scale. And from this measure of communication, PLI, we created undirected weighted networks by using the 128 sensors as nodes and the PLI values as edges. Now, from these networks, we looked at the global efficiency, which is a graph theory measure of the organization. And it is essentially uh, the local efficiency averaged across every pair of nodes in the network, where local efficiency is the inverse of the distance between pairs of nodes. And distance is simply the number of connections it takes to get from one node to the other. Now, we take the inverse so that uh, nodes that have small, short connections are highly efficient and vice versa. Now here's the figure of the stimuli used in the task. We had 1,200 letters that were presented quasi-randomly, and participants responded quickly and accurately to the letter X, but only when it was preceded by the letter A. This provided us with two conditions of interest, the go condition, where participants made a response, and the no-go condition, where they withheld a response. Now here, we have a figure of the N2 component that we saw. We used cluster-based permutation tests to find significant electrodes that showed similar activity to one another. And here, this topographical distribution uh, represents the difference between the no-go from the go condition, which you can see here on the right in the waveforms. Now we found that the difference between no-go and go conditions was smaller in people with um, hyperactive traits. So those with high hyperactivity were less able to differentiate um, their local frontal parietal network during the go condition compared to the no-go condition. Now with those N2 areas, we looked at how that communication with the rest of the global network uh, changes over time. And what we found from looking at five different frequency bands, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, is that the alpha communication showed significant differences from around 400 to 700 milliseconds. And this was greater communication, again, from those N2 areas with the rest of the global network uh, for the no-go condition compared to the go condition. 
Now, looking again at those alpha networks, the, we then wanted to understand how that organization changes over time and whether that change um, is associated with any of the subtypes. So here on the right, you can see our measure of global efficiency over time and how that related with ADHD. Now, in a similar time period from 400 to 500 milliseconds, we found that the global efficiency was related with the inattentive subtype. So this really suggests that those with the inattentive subtype have a reduced ability to configure towards this efficient uh, organization that is necessary to promote inhibition. Now taken together, these results again suggest that people with the hyperactive traits show uh, reduced specialization of the local areas, whereas people with the inattentive traits show a less globally efficient network and a reduced ability to configure during processing. Now, these findings have future implications for ADHD diagnosis and intervention. Being able to differentiate between subtypes with these neurophysiological measures would allow clinicians to tailor their remediation efforts early in diagnosis. And there's also some future research directions that we're interested in. First is to look at how these networks modulate over the course of processing by using dynamic graph measures. And this allows us to examine connections that exist when we look at uh, over the course of time, but then do not exist when we simply have static representations at each time point, which is what we did here. Uh, another method or another future direction would be to understand which of the network characteristics best predict ADHD subtype. Um, there are a lot of measures that can be used to characterize these complex systems. We can look at measures of integration, segregation, information transfer for each different frequency band at the local and global level. And because of this, it might benefit if we can use machine learning methods with feature extraction methods, which would allow us to best understand which of these characteristics are most able to differentiate between ADHD subtype. So these are our results and some of our directions. Thank you for listening.